Welcome to the first ever virtual Power of Women Luncheon, presented by Arizona State University and GSV, sponsored by Google, and featuring the Power of Women Award Ceremony, honoring Rachel Carlson and Esther Wojcicki, a powerful keynote address by Kelly Fitzgerald, and a riveting fireside chat and Q&A session hosted by Romy Newman, featuring special guest Gloria Steinem. And now, live from Chicago, your host, Summit co-founder and power woman, Deborah Quazzo. offices in the Hancock building in Chicago. Um, Octavia Reese, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to have to make, you know, cello a permanent fixture of the GSV <laughs> functions from now on. Octavia, amongst many other attributes, clearly, was the former Mich Miss Michigan uh, a number of years ago. So thanks so much for that. Um, I, I said I'm Deborah Quazzo, the co-founder of the ASU GSV Summit and managing partner of GSV Ventures. And um, I say this every single year, but the Power of Women Ladies Lunch is the absolute highlight for me of the ASU GSV Summit. I always feel like I ought to do the lunch on the first day and go home and go to bed and don't go to the rest of the three days um, because it's, so, it's such a wonderful gathering of extraordinary women. Um, as you all know, this is our first ever virtual event, uh, you know, forced by the tragedies of the COVID crisis. Uh, and while we were, we were three weeks away from the live event when we had to postpone and then ultimately uh, go virtual, and they're, you know, we were deeply um, sad not to be able to get together physically with all of our great community. Uh, the real benefit uh, of, the, of being able to go virtual is the fact that we're actually able to deliver this incredible program. And if you haven't spent a couple of hours in the agenda parsing through the program, it is incredible. 533 extraordinary people in this program. And we're actually able to bring it um, to the entire public for free. And this morning, we actually passed 27,000 registrants, which is something we, of course, can never do um, when we're live in San Diego, although we do hope to be live back in San Diego. We'll always have a hybrid event. Um, the ladies' lunch, or the ha hashtag, the uh, Power of Women lunch, is brought to you by our terrific partners at Google. As many of you know who've attended before, many of you haven't, the summit started in 2010 as a collaboration between Arizona State University and Global Silicon Valley, um, a firm I co-founded with my partner, Michael Moe. Um, the ASU GSV Summit every year connects leading minds focused on transforming society and business around learning and work. Our North Star and our mantra continues to be that all people have equal access to the future through great innovations in education. For the past nine years, we have recognized, formally recognized, I think for, for the past 60 years, we've always recognized, but for the past nine years, we formally recognized the power of women um, through this ladies' lunch opportunity. And it's a provided a great you know, chance for to have riveting discussions among female leaders in the education sector, network with peers, and recognizing, recognize the outstanding achievements of women who have made, been change agents in innovation, education, and empowerment. At the very heart of the ladies' lunch, we honor female ed tech founders and CEOs. It's really the reason the lunch was started, um, who are presenting at ASU GSV. 
This year, we have two, oh, over 257 education and skills technology companies from all over the world presenting. Um, and including, for the first time ever this year, we had a competition called the GSV Cup, where we took, we solicited um, applications from all over the world. We got over 500 and selected 200 of that, of that number to present as part of the GSV Cup competition. Um, and each year we poll the entrepreneurs to ask whether the CEO or founder and or founder is a woman, and if the CEA, CEO and or founder is a person of color. And I'm really pleased to say that we stand out in the tech industry every single year and in fact have strengthened every single year. We're really proud of the fact that pre presenting companies are selected on merit and one third or more have been consistently founded and or led by women. This is true again in 2020 with 35% of presenting companies founded and or led by a woman. This certainly compares with single digits in the overall tech sector, of course. Additionally, 83% 83% of ASU GSV presenting companies this year have a woman, woman in their executive team, our highest percentage ever. We, of course, want 100%, but 83 is good, a good start. Uh, we also continue to see incredibly strong racial diversity with 35% of companies founded and or led by a person of color and over 54% of executive teams having a person of color in leadership. Obviously, we aspire for these numbers to be at least 50% for founders being um, female and 100% and people of color, 100% for executive team representation. But we're making progress and transparency is really a, a, an incredibly key step. Um, I would also add something we're particularly proud of as it relates to, to, to the, our commitment to diversity and, and representation at the summit. We have over 500, we have 533 or so um, participants, talent as we call it, in the summit. Um, we have 153 panels, and which is a lot of panels for anyone who's <laughs> trying to put panels together. 100% uh, of those 153 panels have a woman or person of color as a member. In fact, a number of those panels have 100% women and or person of color as members. Uh, today, we continue the spirit of the program in this new normal practicing the innovation we recognize year after year through this, through this uniquely virtual conference. We, by the way, I think we will continue to have a hybrid approach to the summit where we have both physical and virtual, um, both on a scaled basis. So we invite you to join us in reimagining the conference, Exper experience by playing an active role in today's event. Use the chat to dialogue with speakers, network work with your peers, and con congratulate today's winners. So with that, we will begin um, presenting today's Power of Women Awards and delivering keynote remarks is Kelly Fitzgerald, Director of Video and Sales Development at Google, our fantastic partner in producing the Ladies' Lunch. Hand it over to Kelly. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be in company with Gloria, who I've long admired and honored to have the opportunity to participate in this discussion at such a noteworthy moment. Ever since I was a kid, I've been a prolific note taker. In my parents' attic in Youngstown, Ohio, sit numerous boxes filled with my notebooks and stacks of note cards. And even though I work at Google and I can use voice to text, Google Assistant, or a variety of other tech solutions, I still take handwritten notes. So back in January, when I was planning for the original March 30th date of this event, I jotted down some notes to start shaping my talk. I was to have a fireside chat with Fairy Godboss where we would discuss how the tech industry could benefit from more diverse educational backgrounds. I was gonna share some ideas and insights about attracting and onboarding new talent. And I was gonna demand that male allies and sponsors step up to help. And at that moment, this felt really important. And then along came COVID, the shutdowns, the reconfiguring of work and school and life, and a summer of reckoning with continued relentless racial injustice. What was formerly important demanded to be reevaluated under this new lens. Because of my multiple leadership roles at Google and the two young humans I'm raising at home, I felt an obligation to understand what was happening, demonstrate empathy, and make things better. So I started to read, observe the rapidly evolving trends, and of course, take notes. I'm not gonna bury the lead here. As is stated in the April 2020 UN policy brief on the impact of COVID, across every sphere, from health to the economy, security to social protection, 
the impacts of COVID-19 are exasperated for women and girls simply by virtue of their sex. When we zoom in on the impact to the workplace, the data indicates that decades of progress we've made for women are at risk of coming undone. A Syracuse University research brief reported that over 80% of U.S. adults who aren't working because they have to care for children who are not in school or daycare are women. Boston Consulting Group shared their findings that women spend 15 more hours a week on domestic labor than men. And Catalyst, a nonprofit focused on helping companies better serve women, reports that women are twice as likely as men to be responsible for homeschooling. As can be expected, the women who attempt to maintain their career while managing these additional responsibilities are suffering setbacks. And it's not just embarrassment from their kids screaming in the background of their video conference. A survey from the board list in Qualtrics taught us that more than a third of dads with children at home have received a promotion while working remotely. Among moms, just 9% reported being promoted while working from home. Continuing in this way is untenable, and we already see the impact of women exiting the workplace at higher rates than men. Black women are even more impacted, dealing with all the prior mentioned COVID setbacks while simultaneously shouldering the trauma and mindshare of racial injustice, like showing up to work the day after the Breonna Taylor verdict. For decades at work, women of color have faced challenges with persistent wage disparities and a lack of leadership positions. They're also more likely to be their family's breadwinner than white or Asian women. Thus, the impact of COVID has a deep threat to the economic stability of black women and their families. Emily Martin, the Vice President of Education and Workplace Justice at the National Women's Law Center, implores, we are not going to have a successful recovery unless we center on those that are being harmed the most by this crisis. And that means focusing on the needs of women, specifically women of color. And finally, in the ultimate blow, the Malala Fund released a report on the impact to girls' education as a result of COVID. They warned that if action is not taken, more than 20 million secondary school-aged girls could be out of school permanently due to the crisis. The international community has seen significant progress over the last 20 years to get girls in school and learning, said Philippe Lay, the chief advocacy officer at Malala Fund. Many of these gains are now likely to be undone by the health crisis without targeted action from governments. Whew, holy shit. Am I allowed to say that? Let's all pause for a second and take a breath. You should all see my notebooks from the last six months. They are full of frenetic stats, quotes, names, dates, with arrows, notes in the margins, underlines. I even busted out a highlighter. When defining the now famous growth mindset, psychologist Carol Dweck described a cycle of observe, learn, and improve. I have to admit, during this recent personal cycle of observe and learn, there are moments where I found it very hard to see a clear path to improvement. But I truly believe that a crisis should not go to waste. And so I'll take a pause at the intersection of despair and hope and keep seeking out ways to improve. After all, we cannot exasperate the gap and undo decades of progress. The only option here is to do better. What's coming into focus for me is that our actions as women in leadership and our definition of allyship must become more fluid. And what I mean by this is that sometimes we will need allies to help us progress, and sometimes we will be allies to advocate fiercely for other women. The gravity of this moment has exposed weakness. Existing women in leadership roles, in our quest to earn C-level positions and diversify boards, missed a step. And that is demanding a culture where all women belong. My favorite description of a culture of belonging comes from my colleague at Google, VP of Engineering Liz Reed. Liz and I sit on a leadership team for the 20,000 member Women at Google Employee Resource Group. In a recent Women at Google strategy meeting, Liz said, look, we don't need a program for women at in every single location. We need a culture where every woman has five people at work that she can turn to and say, I'm tired. What a beautiful, simple sentiment. I'm tired. Shoot, we're all tired. We're tired in many ways, from playing many roles, from carrying many burdens. But to be able to admit you're tired at work without fear of repercussion, that is belonging. There are signals of hope and progress, small but meaningful things like the term how to be an ally, which is searched on Google more now than at any other time in history. That is belonging. And the recent passing in the House of the Crown Act which aims to protect against discrimination based on race-based hairstyles in the workplace and at school. 
That is belonging. And when it comes to the impact of COVID, data is showing that the countries which are offering comprehensive support for families, like Germany, France, Canada, and Sweden, have a significantly larger proportion of women in the labor force. That is belonging. At Google, I'm seeing the cycle of observe, learn, and improve through efforts such as a two-week ramp back option when returning from maternity leave, our new carers leave offering, which increased paid leave for employees who have a caregiving responsibility due to COVID, and our flexible work from home arrangements, giving employees the option to work remote through June of 2021. Also, Google's chief diversity officer, Melanie Parker, partnered with John Powell, the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at Berkeley, for a provocative discussions to increase awareness and consideration of belonging. The discussions were based on volumes of research on this topic, and whew, those sessions with John filled my notebook. While there is still much to observe and learn, I believe that women in leadership are uniquely positioned to make things better. So I'd like to end by suggesting three steps we can take, starting today, to drive belonging in our workplaces. Now I know that these three steps will not solve it all. We have a long, complex road ahead, and we're tired. But as Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. So first, we should lean into our ability to read a room or sense that something's off and call it out. We can recognize what perspectives are missing, represent the experiences of those employees or customers, and can change the course of decisions by using our voice. This skill of sensing is one which we must not undervalue. I look back and cringe at the times that I sensed something wasn't right, but I didn't speak up because I didn't have the data to support my hunch. I'm committed to speaking up and even have prompts in my notebook like, I can't help but notice, or this discussion is making me curious about, to ignite the most inclusive representative dialogue in meetings. Second, we should take inventory of who we are mentoring and sponsoring and ensure that we are not falling prey to, like me, bias. This is where we can demonstrate allyship fluidity by being allies to others. As a leader, one of your most precious resources is your time. Are you giving that time to people who will benefit from the support? And how are you finding worthy mentees who might not have the confidence or relationships in place to connect with you? And third, we must lead the conversations in our workplace which advocate for more flexibility and family-friendly policies. Even if we're not the ones who need or will benefit from those policies, we should do so because it will help keep more women in the workplace. A recent Careers Pulse survey from GFK and Google found that women are 27% more likely than men to want to work for an employer that strives for gender equality. So how is your workplace demonstrating that intention to women? Let's commit to continued observation and learning. Let's stay hopeful and curious, even when it's hard and when we're tired. And let's anchor on improvement. And as we prepare to welcome Gloria Steinem, let's bear in mind her words from the 1993 Wellesley Commencement Address. An education is not a thing that one gets, but a lifelong process. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts with you and make sense of the many notes from my notebooks. Now I am honored to present the 2020 Power of Women Award to two amazing women. The Power of Women Award recognizes female CEOs leading and achieving successful outcomes for companies at scale in the learning and talent technology sector. The first award goes to Rachel Carlson, co-founder and CEO at Guild Education. Guild is on a mission to unlock opportunity for the 88 million Americans who are in need of education and reskilling to compete in the future of work. Prior to find, founding Guild, Rachel was the CEO of Student Blueprint and served as a political appointee during the Obama administration. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much to Deborah and the GSV team for this incredible honor and, and recognition. I'm beyond grateful to be joining you all here today and it's a particular honor to receive this award though in virtual company and I wish we were all together with so many incredible female leaders who I look up to. This luncheon has been a highlight of my year um, since the first year I attended while in graduate school. Um, 
I, I see the Power of Women Award as a recognition of the work that our entire team at Guild and all of our partners and our students have been doing. Um, and that team is made up of some truly amazing women. Uh, I, uh, I often think of the phrase, we, we stand on the shoulder of giants. And, and for me and my entrepreneurial journey, I, I stand on the shoulders of my grandma B who taught me that you can have an amazing career and be a, a mother. She was a mother of seven and was the executive director of a preschool while she had her sixth and seventh running around in the pseudo daycare in the back of the preschool. And so I, I think of her and I think of amazing women I get to work with today, like Bijal Shah and Jess Rusin and uh, others who are paving the way in, in leading technology teams and, and inspiring so many women in our company. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. I, it, it, would, um, it would not be possible without a, a company-wide focus to serve the American workforce that we're aiming to. At, at Guild, we're on a mission to unlock economic opportunity for millions of Americans through education and upskilling. And we believe the the moment we're living in right now and the world we're living in makes this even more important than ever before. There are 88 million Americans in need of upskilling and reskilling, some 64 million of them who don't have a college degree. And that those numbers were before COVID. We've seen that accelerate in March and we've seen the gaps in, in education and opportunity wildly exacerbated for disadvantaged communities and demographic groups of all types. Um, the, the pandemic has dramatically and disproportionately impacted women and students of color and parents and low income communities. And at Guild, our priority has always been to figure out how to serve as many students as possible. And so we're working hard to, to stay on that mission. Um, this award makes me think of our students. I, I was thinking about which of our female students have been inspiring me most lately. And we were recently learning about a student named Leanne Rogers who, who works at Discover Financial. Uh, she's a single mom who had been you know, on her way in a great career for many years, but simply felt like she couldn't afford and couldn't find the time to go back to school while caring for her child. And, and um, she's now on that journey, thanks to help from her guild coaches and support from her company. Uh, and she's, she's setting a precedent for her daughter and, and really changing her family's trajectory. So to me, the, the award is a recognition of our students like Leanne and the progress we've made, but also the significant work that remains. And as a, a final mention, I think given the important racial reckoning of this year and the conversations happening around the US, I think it's important as a group of women who all lead organizations that we recognize we can play an outsized role in creating space for conversations about seen and unseen diversity beyond gender. And at Guild, we've had real success in driving gender parity, but like many organizations, we have significant work to do to increase our focus on racial and ethnic diversity within Guild and in our work, and broadly to focus on diversity of all kinds. So I hope we create space this week and throughout this year as women in leadership to keep having those conversations and, and driving change for all communities. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to celebrate with all of you here today and, and more than anything, grateful for the affirmation of the work at Guild um, and what we're trying to do. So thank you so much and have a wonderful week. The next award is presented to Dr. Esther Wojcicki, a leading American educator and journalist. Over the course of her career, Dr. Wojcicki has become famous for three things. First, teaching a high school class that has changed thousands of kids' lives. Second, inspiring Silicon Valley legends like Steve Jobs. And third, raising three famously successful daughters. Dr. Wojcicki has generously shared her life lessons for raising, educating, and managing people to their highest potential in her best-selling books, Moonshots in Education, and How to Raise Successful People. At age 80, she has recently co-founded an edutech startup called Track with a former PA high school student of hers. The company takes Esther's approach to teaching, empowering students, and delivers peer-to-peer -peer learning at scale via video. Hello, everyone. 
I am so honored by this Power of Women Award. Years ago, when I was a young journalist, struggling to be accepted by the all-male journalism world, I never thought I would be winning an award like the Power of Women Award. Nor did I think my three daughters would rise to the top of their professions. It has been a struggle for years, but it has been worth it, because now I see a path open for so many women to achieve their dreams. It isn't only women, but people of all races, religions, and colors. Empowering my students has been my goal since I started as a teacher 50 years ago. Thank you so much for this wonderful recognition. It is a privilege to be here with all of you. Terrific. Um, thanks again to Kelly, and congratulations to two of my absolute favorite humans, uh, Rachel Carlson and Esther Wojcicki, um, on your incredibly well-deserved 2020 Power of Women Awards. You, you two are both brilliant. Uh, I now have the uh, incredible pleasure of introducing our next speaker moderator, Romy Newman, um, who is who is the founder, co-founder, and president of Fairy God Boss, uh, a company that GSV Ventures is, has the great privilege of having invested in. She will lead the last segment of our program, a fireside chat with Gloria Steinem. Uh, at Fairy God Boss, the, the intent is to empower women to empower women to improve the workplace for women everywhere. Um, they're the largest site for career women uh, in the country. And her powerful career platform is a free, anonymous employer review site for women by women to discover jobs, connect, and get advice. Uh, if you haven't signed up for Fairy God Boss, I strongly recommend that you do it after this talk. Um, I'm, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rumi. I will, I will note, we had a, a little change yesterday. Um, in uh, Gloria Steinem had a family emergency and was supposed to be here live to take Q&A and, and do photos, but she was gracious enough to actually record her interview with Romy last night, so you're going to hear an extremely compelling and actually longer interview today. about. So thank you so much and off to Romy. Thank you, Deborah. I'm excited to, I'm beyond excited to be here today to be talking to a true icon and an idol of mine, one of the most powerful voices on issues of equality for nearly five decades, writer, lecturer, political activist, and feminist organizer, the one and only Gloria Steinem. Um, Gloria founded New York and Ms. Magazine, and she authored several books, including The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Piss You Off. And she co-founded the National Women's Political Caucus, the Ms. Foundation for Women, the Free to Be Foundation, and the Women's Media Center in the United States. Among her many awards, she co-produced an Emmy Award-winning TV documentary, and she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. That was terrible. President Barack Obama. Without further ado, let's welcome Gloria Steinem. Thank you so much. Now, we have to have a long interview so I can live up to your introduction. I have no question that you will. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have to start with this because it's just so timely. You were friends with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You and she were contemporaries. You, took very different paths to achieve the same objectives. Can you tell us a little bit about your friendship with her? Uh, Ruth, I first met her when she was initiating the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU, and that was about 1970. Uh, she was always ahead of all of us. Somehow she was there before there was a movement. <laughs> so uh, she was thoughtful, funny, direct. You knew she was incredibly smart because you could understand every word she said. <laughs> and the very first project we entered into together was one in which she was trying to support the reproductive rights of all women and understanding that that meant the right to have children as well as the right not to have children. So she had sent me to interview a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer uh, who had been sterilized without her knowledge or permission when she went into the hospital for another purpose. So that was 
that was the beginning. And, um, you, you know, I, I, I don't know how to, you know, I think everybody else on the court, we used to say, did she vote right or did he vote right? With Ruth, however she voted, you knew it was right. Absolutely. So this has been a devastating year overall, and especially for women, especially for lower income women, and especially for women of color. Women are facing significant and disproportionate challenges from the economy because they're on the front lines as an essential worker, because they're homeschooling and managing a poor childcare infrastructure. Women are dropping out of the workforce and they're crossing the poverty line. What are you hearing? And how will we come through this without losing progress? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're in a time of transformation. That's clear. So the question is, what is it transforming to? I hope that everything that you just said is underlining the injustice, the economic and social and racial injustice that is before us now. We, I, I, I don't think anyone can deny it. And also, precisely because we are at home, not at work, um, or many of us, other people are also at work, but we, we are seeing it, I believe. We can't deny it. So I hope that we use this as a passage of consciousness, of understanding, after all, if 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 COVID, if this, whatever it is, you know, doesn't recognize race or gender or class or national boundaries, why should we? On the one hand, on the other hand, people are suffering so unequally from this that we cannot deny it anymore. So we have to use this passage, this change, this huge leap of consciousness and realization in a positive way. Absolutely. Uh, so talking about leaps of consciousness, I hope. Uh, this year, the Black Lives Matter has brought racial justice issues to the forefront of public conversation and media attention. And throughout your career, you've made it a real priority to always share the stage with Black women how can feminists of all backgrounds support Black women right now? Well, uh, there, in every way, you know, depending on what we're getting up and doing tomorrow. Uh, simple ways, you know, if we're on a panel and the panel doesn't look like the country, there's probably something wrong with it. Uh, more historical ways, understanding that women of color in general, and especially black women, have always been way disproportionately likely to be feminists and to be leaders of the women's movement. There was a poll done in the early days of the movement, which, uh, when people were asked, are you interested in the women's liberation movement? 96% of black women said yes, and barely half of white women said yes. Uh, and if you if you look at the voting pattern, I mean, we we must understand that this is not and never has been, a, as it is sometimes depicted. I'm sorry to say, in the media, a mostly white movement which is striving to be quote inclusive unquote. It is a mostly a disproportionately women of color movement, uh, and. We must always present it that way, in every way, large and small. Really important perspective. So I got to read your book, My Life on the Road, and one of the things I loved about it the most was this concept of talking circles and how you felt you could learn so much more, you could understand people so much better by getting out and spending real time with them. And yet now we're in this circumstance where our country's never been more divided, right? And, and we are trying to build empathy with those with whom we disagree, or we may even think are intolerant. How do, how do we do that? How can we build bridges in this divided time? First of all, we're not equally divided. Uh, and I think it's important to say that because two thirds of the country 
agrees with all of the social justice movements, whether it is the environmental movement, the feminist movement, the gay and lesbian movement. I mean, consciousness has changed. It's only if you look, I'm just going by public opinion polls, about a third of the country disagrees. So I, I, I don't think necessarily we need to think about convincing the third. We need to think about moving forward with the two thirds. We should certainly reach out and be accessible and be uh, bridges. I totally agree. But I fear that as women, we have this impulse <laughs> to, you know, it's as if our, our style of leadership is based on the family. So, you know, the family all has to move together. So I fear that we would be in a room and we would have 100 people on one side of the room who were ready to move and 30 on the other side who were saying no and we'd try to convince the 30 instead of moving with the 100. So, you know, I just think we should stay in communication, but move forward. Speaking of communication, so um, one of the things you wrote in the book was you said people in the same room understand and empathize with each other in a way that isn't possible on the page or screen. And yet now we're in this horrible situation where nearly all of our interactions are virtual. You and I are sitting here, we're virtual right now, right? What is the impact of this going to be on our long-term culture? Well, I, I, I don't think we know yet, but it is apparently true that, I mean, f first of all, we can learn, we can understand, we can do a very great deal. That statement about all five senses applies to empathy, really understanding fully what someone else is feeling. So I do think we need never to be completely content with an inanimate screen or a piece of paper, much as I love writing, <laughs> that, that we need to understand the value of sitting down with each other, talking to each other. You know, the, the, the talking circle, which is the original form of decision-making, legislating, communication, is a circle in which everyone speaks, everyone listens, there's often a talking stick that you pass around so that everyone is treated equally. It was our form of uh, human organization long before the idea of hierarchy, which is quite new in human history. So we need to strive for that and treasure that at all times. And I think that people are using Zoom and all of these forms in a very imaginative and circular way. I mean, it isn't that one person is getting on a Zoom and lecturing everybody else. We're sitting here talking to each other. So we can at least use this not quite complete form in a circular and democratic way. Absolutely. Another thing I really enjoyed about your book is how much um, persistence and and sheer energy you applied in the face of a lot of adversity. Um, whether it was staging the convention in Houston with, with Phyllis Shapley's convention right across the street. How do you, how do you draw strength to, to um, make change and persevere even in the face, face of such adversity? Well, that's what a movement is for, you know, that we, we are communal animals, we need each other, we can't do it by ourselves. A movement is like a big family, a very diverse, but we share values. Uh, and we support each other uh, in a way that ca absolutely cannot be replaced. It, it's, um, it, it's difficult, I mean, that was not so difficult because the power was not on the other side. Now it's more difficult because we have a virus in the White House, you might say. And so there's, a, <laughs> there's, more, there's more power there, but we still just need to move forward. And I hope we don't get a case of the shoulds, you know, what should I do? Right. To just every day do every single thing we can. So you described yourself as an entrepreneur of social change. 
I strive also to be an entrepreneur of social change. And actually, this is a conference full of entrepreneurs of social change. So you obviously made change and rose up through the public sector. How do you think the private sector can or should be helping drive social change that's so needed today in our challenging environment? Well, it would, it would be nice if everybody got paid equally. Just to pay women of all races equally would put $400 billion more in the economy every year. And that would so help the economy. I mean, it's exactly what, what we need. If we, if we start, if we consider it as concentric circles and change what we can, uh, then it will build outward. It's not rocket science, you know, it's sort of what we do every day. For instance, one thing we could do is tell each other how much we make. Right, right. <laughs> you know, in New York State, we, we had to pass the, the fair pay something law because it was against the law for employees to tell each other how much they made. But that's the one thing we know. And if we share it, we can dis discover what inequalities there really are. That's not, that's, that's not so hard, right? <laughs> so we, we just need to start where, wherever we are and uh, look at unfairness. Is there, um, are there parental leave provisions for men as well as women? because men are parents too. If children deserve to be nurtured, they'll never know that men are loving and nurturing unless they experience it. So the equality goes in both directions. Absolutely. So tomorrow, there's a new film about your life being released. It's called The Glorias. It's directed by Julie Taymor. And you're being played by several amazing actresses, including Julianne Moore. Um, what is that like to be the subject of major film? And what do you hope the world will take away from it? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, when uh, Julie Taymor called me up and said she wanted to make a movie out of my road book, I just said yes, you know, because I don't know if you've seen Across the Universe, her wonderful film about the peace movement, Frida, about Frida Kahlo. I think she's the genius filmmaker of our time. And I knew that she would show the emotional truth, which is the important thing. So I had nothing to do with how she did it. She's invented all kinds of things I never could have thought of, like a Greyhound bus through time, for instance, <laughs> to, to bridge all the decades and two continents because it <laughs> takes place here and in India. She, she is, it's just, it's just amazing. It's amazing. And, um, my, I guess my deepest hope about it is that people who, especially women, but not only women, who see it realize that each of our stories is important. Mine is not, you know, I am not uh, a president or a king or, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> each of our stories is important. And there, there is, you know, as the poet said, the universe is not made up of atoms, it's made up of stories. Love that. So what's next for you after this film, in this difficult year? What are you taking on next? Uh, well, my publisher would like to know that <laughs> because I have several books that are, I'm committed to and that are due. One is I'm writing with two friends, and it is about how we started out, the subject we started out with. We're talking about the women of color, in this case, African-American women, who were disproportionately the, the leaders of the women's movement in the 60s and 70s and 80s. You might say it's the missing figures, like the movie of the, of the women's movement. Uh, another one is, is one I had hoped to write with Wilma Mankiller, who was the chief of the Cherokee Nation, which is taking um, features of original cul cultures, ancient cultures, that we could use now and bringing them back. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you just one example because it sounds a little too general, I think. But for instance, in, in, a, in one of the oldest societies in Ghana, 
if someone does an a, a antisocial thing, they are punished by separation from the group. Because since we are communal animals, isolation is the universal most difficult experience. But for a short time, they are isolated. But when they are brought back into the culture, everyone in the culture or everyone who knows that person tells that person every good thing they ever did. Wow. So they're knitted back into the group. Now we do pretty much the opposite with people who have been imprisoned. We continue to punish them. We sometimes even take away their vote or their ability to get a job. Mm-hmm. So there are just a whole series of ways that we can le- learn from the original cultures before there was patriarchy and monotheism, when we were more circular. Sounds amazing. <laughs> well, Gloria, thank you so much for spending time with us here today and for sharing your perspective. I'm so honored and grateful to have spent time with you. Thank you. Can I, can I just say how honored and grateful I am to women who are the future because you have demystified technology. I mean, of course, women were there at the beginning of technology, weren't they, as the inventors? But when money and organization comes into it, uh, it may be a different story. But I'm so proud of you. It makes me so happy to see the word women combined with technology. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, one one thing I would like to ask is what your hopes are for uh, girls and education in technology. Yeah. Well, so I have a daughter who's turning seven. And it's so so top of mind for me that coding and technology really is the currency of the future, right? So I'm, I'm always thinking about how can we make sure that she's engaging with it. And, and it does somehow, education does sometimes still get disproportionately segmented. So I think we always have to think about rebalancing and how are we advancing girls in STEM in a natural way? It is definitely top of mind for me. There is an organization called Girls Who Code. Great organization, absolutely. <laughs> I think another question for, for me is, how do we how do we activate how how can we make change seeing what's happening right now in politics in the courts what what's your recommendation for how do we um, get action and and help mm-hmm. kind of <clears throat> restart the dialogue in a more positive direction well the first is the simplest if we don't vote we don't exist right the voting booth is the only place where we are all equal. And we have to not only vote, but fight to vote. Mm -hmm. And never in my lifetime or any other time that I have even read about is, has an election been more important than the one that's coming up. And we may have to be patient with it and stick with it too, because it's going to take longer to vote. And so we can't, accept uh, a a result if it's not complete, if it doesn't seem fair. This is our voice. There's nothing, nothing more important right now. And and I hope when we vote, if we can, we, if we're doing it online or however we're doing it, your, your daughter, you know, take your daughter with you because that's how, that's what I remember voting with my mother, you know, (laughs) it's, it's it's how we learn how important this is. The young people tend to vote less than other age groups, which is the least um, practical because they're going to be stuck with the result for the longest period of time. So if we are going to focus on, on groups that are under voting, I think especially young people and especially people of color. Wonderful. We will all get out and vote. Mm -hmm. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much. What a treat. I hope I hope to do it again. Okay. (laughs) All right.
let's do that. Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies, I think we are heading into a wrap for the opening kickoff to the ASU GSV Summit. Um, I want to strongly recommend to everyone who's in the audience to really to go on and spend some time in the agenda, particularly the equality and truth and reconciliation channels that we've developed um, over the all five of the days, actually. I think it's really incredibly compelling um, content. It's all the content is compelling, let me start with that. But coming off our conversation with Gloria Steinem, I think those, those channels are particularly pertinent. Um, but thank you so much, and thanks one more time to our friends at Google for sponsoring this year's luncheon. We, we can't do it without our partners, and we're so grateful to them. Um, special thank you to all of our presenters, our award winners, and our featured guest, Gloria Steinem, and thank her uh, for her flexibility and commitment to doing this. Um, and most impl importantly, thank you all for joining us and being present and celebrating the power of women. We will have um, a video of this session, and which you can share with others, but uh, we're very excited for the rest of the summit, so thanks so much. Oh, sorry, we're going to raise a glass. Sorry, I forgot about that part. Not like me. Okay, thank you.